Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we are once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we therefore are Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us. Amen. So this, this is quite a lot of scripture. So sometimes it's actually good to, to, to see this, to see scripture in a parable. So we'll use wooden spoons. I don't want to hear anything more about it. I'm sorry to disturb you. You caught him. But I had my eye on this man. Oh, and thank God. I'm very angry with you, Jean Valjean. What happened to your eye, Monseigneur? Didn't he tell you he was our guest last night? Oh, yes. After we searched his knapsack and found all this silver, he claimed. <laughs> that you gave it to him. Yes. Of course I gave him the silverware. But why didn't you take the candlesticks? That was very foolish. Madame Gillot, fetch the silver candlesticks. They're worth at least 2,000 francs. Why did you leave them? Hurry. Monsieur Valjean has to get going. He's lost a lot of time. Did you forget to take them? Are you saying he told us the truth? Of course. Thank you for bringing him back. I'm very relieved. Release him. You're really letting me go? Didn't you understand the bishop? Madame Gillot, offer these men some wine. They must be thirsty. Thank you. Don't forget. Don't ever forget. You've promised to become a new man. Promise? Why are you doing this? Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I've bought your soul. I've ransomed you from fear and hatred. And now I give you back to God. Wow, I don't know if that moves your heart, but that is an amazing story. That is an amazing parable of that, um, of that part of Scripture that we just read. I, I love the part where Jean Valjean, he, he asks, why are you doing this? It, it just doesn't even make sense. Why are you doing this? 
And the answer is because of love. It's because of love that this, this uh, priest, this monk, ransoms Jean Valjean. In this, in this moment with the police, he extends grace, something that, something that Jean Valjean didn't expect, didn't understand. And this is, the, this is the parable of Easter. This is the story of God's type of love that he has for us. And this is our story, church. Just like, just like in that, that little clip, it says, church, uh, he said, you no longer belong to evil, but with this costly silver, with this sacrifice, I have bought your souls. And that's what Christ does for us. He ransomed us from fear and hatred and has given us back to God the Father. Amen? If that doesn't get you excited, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what does. So today we're going to look at actually a special type of love. There's a couple different types written in the Bible. And so we'll talk about what are the different types of love. We'll talk about what, what is the defining type of love that God has for us. And then how do we apply this type of love? So why are you doing this? It goes back to that question that Jean Valjean said. And, and the answer is love. The problem is that in Vietnamese, is the, the word for love is actually a little bit, quite a bit better than we have in English. In English, our, our version of love is, is terrible, actually. I'm, I'm embarrassed that our, our definition of love in English is so kind of like meaningless because it's so vast and so large. I'm, I'm not going to raise, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but if you just go out on the street and ask people what love is, you're going to get all types of answers, right? And, and what's strange about this is that we think about love all the time. We, we know what love is. Deep down, we know it's almost laughable that we wouldn't be able to get definition of love. But it's just so deep that sometimes we're unable to articulate it. We're unable to vocalize it. All of our, our olden day legends, our, our uh, great literature works, all talk, talk about love, touch on love at least a little bit. But it's really hard for us to define love in a, in a real meaningful way. Uh, and, and that's what's so wonderful about the Bible, is the Bible gives us de a definition of love that's almost realer than real. It's a definition of love that we can truly understand. And it's not just words, but it's examples. And that's, that's the whole beauty of it. People often ask, what is, what is the meaning of life? And one of the, the most intelligent and, and wise persons in the Bible is King Solomon, and he penned this, this little note in uh, Proverbs that says, what a person desires is unfailing love. So what a person desires is unfailing love. This is a very deep, uh, a very deep, almost like a secret. So you know something that's at the deepest part of my soul is I'm desiring this unfailing love. I know that that, that is the same in your heart too. But it brings us back to the problem. Okay, well, what is love? You know, we have so many songs about love. We have all of these different definitions of love. Like when you're in English, you know, you can say, oh, I love my family, I love my mom, I love my, my dog, um, I, I love my wife, I love my husband, I love pizza, you know. Uh, we have the, the word making love. And so all of this is like, okay, like when you are talking about love, you're talking about you know, your family, you're talking about how you like your animals, you're talking about, um, you know, uh, all of this kind of stuff, making love. It's, it's actually unbelievably wide and crazy that our, our definition of love is so, so almost obtuse. Uh, it, it doesn't really make sense to try and define it. There's three sort of logical types of love. They're, they're pretty straightforward. So, storge, uh, that's the that you have for your family, for your, for your mom, for your dad, for your siblings. It's this, this deep affection that you have traveled through life family, that you are, you are invested in them. In, uh, in English, we say blood is water. So you have this, this deep love, this deep connection, and, and that's what the Greek, that's what the Bible calls uh, storge. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. We can understand that, that kind of love. We have friendship. 
We have this, this, this friendship that as you, as you work together, as you live together, that you develop this friendship, you develop this, this like of, the other, of uh, your friends. Um, and this is phileo. So Philadelphia is the, the city, the phileo, the, the city of brotherly kindness, uh, brotherly love. I, I've never been there, so I, I, don't, I can only guess how uh, brotherly kind they are. But uh, yes, so, th- so that's, how, that's where that word comes from. And then the other type of sort of logical love that, uh, that we all almost immediately think of is... The Princess Bride, the romantic, that, that, that love, that erotic love, that eros, that burning desire it's exemplified in, in, uh, in music and, and all that kind of stuff, in poetry. That's, that's sort of the one type of love that, that we all think about. But the problem is in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, it says, God is love. And so you look at these definitions and you go, okay, um, you know, I love my family. Well, hopefully you love your family. Um, but say if you don't have a family, does that mean you haven't ever experienced God? You know, you, your friendships. Friendship love is, is wonderful, but that, that, doesn't, that doesn't encapsulate all that the, the love that, that you would expect God to embody. And eros, um, erotic love, that, that doesn't make sense. Like when you think of... Um, there has been sort of uh, idols and, and Ashra poles in the Old Testament. That was the, the god of um, erotic love. That was sort of fertility. Um, when Paul was in Ephesus, he was in Ephesus for two years. And actually in Ephesus, there was uh, the seventh wonder of the ancient world. And that was the temple of Diana or Artemis, which was this goddess of erotic love, of uh, fertility. But that doesn't make sense because that's not who God is. So those are the four logical loves. And now we get to talk about one of the most beautiful types of loves. And this love is, is um, almost like an illogical love, and it's called agape. And what really makes it beautiful is that, is that uh, it's this self-emptying love. It's this divine love that, that God has for us. God gives himself to us. He sacrifices. It's, it's unselfish. It's loyal. It's uh, benevolent concern for somebody else. It doesn't, it's not, uh, it's not prejudice. It's not selective. It's God loves us. And this, this love is a, such a deep love that it's even hard for, for humans to have, to have that kind of love for each other. And it's, it's something so deep that we all long for, but we don't see it in our, in our world very often. So when we talk about love, I, I want you to, to think about agape, okay? We're, we're not, we're not going to use the English word today. We're going to try and use the, the Greek agape. Um, and, and what's really amazing about this word is that, is that it's because of God's agape. It's because of God's love for us that he does all of this. When it says in the Old Testament when um, God brought Israel out of Egypt, it was because he loved them. It wasn't because Israel was so awesome or so smart or had done so many things. But in Deuteronomy 4, it says, because he loved your ancestors and chose their descendants after them, that's why he brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength. So this was that covenantal love of God. God s- delivered the Israelites, because of who God was, because of the agape love of God. And it gets even wilder. Okay, so you have the, the Old Testament, and the Old Testament was translated into Greek, and this was actually one of the first times that uh, Greek actually had the noun agape. It usually was just used as a verb, right? Love is a verb. But uh, when when the Septuagint, when the Bible was translated into Greek, we actually started to see this noun version. There was like a a personification of the word love. And that's where Jesus comes in. That's where God comes in. This this, uh, personification of love is, is Jesus Christ. Are you tracking with me? 
So we, 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 got, we got a couple new words. We have uh, storge, which is, you know, your love for your family. You, we have phileo, which is, you know, your, your friends. We have um, um, eros, um, your husband-wife relationship. And uh, now we have agape. And this is, this is that unconditional love of God. So Jesus, the Word became flesh and dwelling among us. This Word became flesh, this, this logos, this... I, Maybe this is stepping too far, but this new word is, is agape. This agape was made flesh and made its dwelling among us. So when, when God wanted to explain what agape was, he didn't just, you know, say, okay, Paul, write out all this. He, he sent Jesus to, to show people uh, what it meant to, to be love. Um, and... Like uh, Pastor Regan said last week, um, the Bible has the best definition of love, and it doesn't really doesn't really do it in a very technical way. But it it, dis- it explains what it is. It's not just a definition, but it defines what agape what agape is. Agape uh, in First Corinthians thirteen, agape is patient, agape is kind, agape does not envy. It has your best interests in mind. Agape doesn't boast. It is not proud. Uh, Love doesn't say, I'm better than you, um, and put you down uh, in order to build myself up. Agape is not rude. Agape does not insist on its own way. It's, it's, uh, but but here, this is actually an interesting thing. So, So Jesus actually gives us free will. He doesn't insist on us doing it his way, but he gives us the choice. He says, my way is actually the best way. If you do it my way, even if you don't understand, because I have your best interests, it will work out for you in amazing ways that you can't even understand. Love is not, agape is not irritable. It is not resentful. It's forgiving. And this is all of these things. You have to remember, this is Jesus too. Jesus is kind with us. Jesus is patient with us. Jesus does not envy. He is not arrogant. He is not rude. He is not irritable. He is not resentful. He does not rejoice in wrongdoings. Agape does not write down everything that you've done wrong to to get you back later. Agape bears all things. Agape believes all things. It has faith. Agape has hope. Agape hopes for all things. It endures all things. There's perseverance there. Agape never fails. And just as all of these things are speaking about agape, they're they're speaking about Jesus too. You know what? Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things for us. He hopes all things. He He endured all things. And his love never ends. His love never fails. So now faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and agape, abide in these, but the greatest of these is agape. The greatest of these is love. So what I, I really like about this is that it, it doesn't quite make sense. Why would the King of Kings, God, uh, give his most precious thing for me, for you? And, and this, is, this is why it's so illogical. Why, why would that... Um, in that example of Jean Valjean, why would Jean Valjean um, be forgiven? Why would he get another chance? And that's the illogical nature of agape. In Vietnamese, actually, this is a very hard concept to, to translate. So English is really bad for the word love. Well, Vietnamese is really bad for the word grace. It is, it, it, it's really difficult to translate that concept of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy, but yet I get something. And, uh, and so, you know, there's, there's sort of dictionary definitions that kind of work, but um, the problem is that uh, it's kind of like the word charity, actually. Charity means grace, but when we think of accepting charity, we think of it as kind of condescending. I'm I'm smaller than somebody else and I'm accepting something. And, and the problem with grace is that it, it actually shouldn't be condescending. It should be something so joyful. And uh, that, that's a, a problem that Vietnamese has because it has that sort of condescending part that's hard to, to take apart. 
So in Romans 5, 7, it says, for, uh, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one might even dare to die. But God showed his love for this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were unworthy, while we were unattractive, while we still had all of this death inside of our lives, Christ died for us. Therefore, we have been justified by his blood. How much more will we be saved through him from the wrath of God, from the judgment of God? And wow, this is so wonderful. You know, we're unworthy. Uh, we have nothing to really logically attract uh, the God to us. But yet, he still pursues us. He still sacrifices for us. It's a really bad trade for God. Think about it. It's a bad trade. He just, he gets us, and, and we're broken people. But God, God doesn't see it that way. God looks at you. He looks at your future, and he's like, you know what? If, if, my, if my kids, if they understood how much I love them, there's that that possibility that they can they can do great things that they would have their lives that would be radically changed that they would um, like we'll talk about later they have these me, uh, this ministry of reconciliation for God so agape that's a bad conjunction I'm I'm sorry we have a theological uh, <coughs> professor here so God's so agape he so loved the world um, that he gave his only son he gave his only son. He gave his most precious thing to demonstrate how much value we have to him. Jesus in, uh, in John 15 says, My command is this, to agape each other as I have agaped you, to love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he la lays down his life for his friends. And this, this is very true. This is the greater love has no one than this, he who gives his life for his friends. But this is when Jesus is actually talking to his friends. So he can't take this out of context here. So Jesus, when you're with your friends, your life is your most important thing. However, that's not all, uh, all the experience that we have in, uh, in, in our human walk. You know, you have get married, you have kids, then what sort of becomes the most important thing? Your kids become the most important thing. You're, you know, you, you have your husband-wife relationship, that's, that's sort of the relationship you focus on, but that your kids are so precious to you. And so this is, this is a, a really amazing thing. Like, for, for me, I'll talk about uh, Storge for a bit, family love. So I have a, a wonderful little sister. She's 12 years younger than me. My parents definitely got better with practice because uh, I, I am who I am, and my sister's wonderful. So, um, uh, and, you know, I've been back and forth in, in Vietnam so long, and, and when I would go home my, when I was younger, uh, my sister still runs up and gives me a hug, but uh, I remember that was actually one of the things I really looked forward to going home. My sister would be at the airport, and she was like, you know, this big, and she'd run, and she'd like, Matthew, and give me this huge hug, and I was Wow, I love you so much, Chelsea. Um, and this was just storge. This was just the type of love that you have in your family. And you know what? I would not trade that love that I have my, for my sister for somebody who didn't deserve it. I wouldn't tr trade it for anybody. I wouldn't trade it for 30 pieces of silver. I wouldn't trade it for 100 pieces of silver. That is so precious. And But what we what we see is this is what God did. So the Father God was a parent, and his most precious thing was his son. And, and this is where it gets a little bit weird. Um, but this is actually how the, the Trinity, well, w one of the ways the Trinity makes it all work out is that, you know, if you're a father and you wanted something a lot, and uh, you wanted to show that you wanted a lot, if you just gave your kid Everybody would be like, okay, you're a negligent father because what type of father would give their kid for something? Um, and, and same if a son. If a son is told to do something and all they do is that one thing, you know, that's, that's sort of kind of like hubris. Is it, you, you just sort of follow it. You don't have to, to think for yourself. You're like, okay, I'm just obeying my parents. And 
and the whole complexity. What one of one of St. Patrick's things is he described the Trinity like a clover. You know, there's there's three leaves, but it's all it's all one thing. Just like God, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they're all working together. And so, so the thing is that God the Father says, you know what, my church, you, everybody in this room, I love you so much, I want to give my best for you. And, and instead of being a negligent parent and saying, go, it's like Jesus the Son saying, God, uh, Father, I, I love you. I'm willing to obey you in whatever way, and I, I'm willing to sacrifice my love for these people. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is all about the presence of God. And the Holy Spirit is like, you know what? I'd be willing to sacrifice um, not being in the presence of Jesus for, um, for this time uh, if this actually brings the Father joy. And so, and so it's this wonderful working of these uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all sacrificing for each other, sacrificing for us, His His children. So God did all this so that we would have a future with him, so that we would uh, be the children of God and this chance at at, uh, experiencing this agape love. So Ephesians, in Ephesians it says, praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in all the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in agape, in love, predestined us for the adoption to sonship, to uh, daughtership in his, in his kingdom, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which we are freely given in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sin, in accordance to the riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us. So this basically says that you were born for this, You were handcrafted for agape. You were handcrafted to experience this love of God. And that's why it's so deep in us. That's why when we watch these films, we're like, wow, that is so meaningful. And it's because God has placed it so deep in our hearts. This This is what brings our life meaning. It always comes to this point where we're like, okay, what's the meaning in life? You know, do I matter? Am I worthwhile? Am I loved? Does my life have meaning? And this is the, God's answer to you. The agape is God's answer to you. You know, what's the meaning of my life? Well, that which gives your life meaning. And God created us with this deep longing for agape. And in this love, in this agape love, that's where we find this meaning. And more than that, God doesn't just tell us he loves us. God demonstrates he loves us. So Jesus is God's answer. Jesus answers the question, am I loved? Am I worthwhile? Do I matter? Does my life have meaning? And Jesus says, yes, because I'm willing to sacrifice this for you. Yes, because I'm willing to do this for you. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And this is the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. In, in Psalms, it's, it talks about, uh, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And, and the really wonderful thing in that is it's kind of circular. It's as you're delighting yourself in agape, as you're delighting yourself in the Lord, God pours into you more of his love. And then, you, and then it's like he gives you this desire of your heart, which is this agape love. And then it just keeps on going and going and progressing. And it, it's just this beautiful work of God moving and, and teaching us and it, helping to, us to experience this love more and more. So what does it mean to be a new creation? Well, it means that we're supposed to love the Lord. We're supposed to agape the Lord, uh, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, there is a problem with neighbor as yourself stuff though. And the problem with loving your neighbor as yourself is actually most of us are really good at that. You know, we hate our neighbor and we hate ourselves. And, um, and the problem with that is that that's actually, that's actually one, of, one of Satan's important tools is that if he convince us that we are meaningless, if he can convince us that we have no value to God, then, then, that, then that's an amazing tool that him, the accuser, uses against us. So 
For example, if I, uh, if I saved up all my pennies, if I uh, worked really hard or, uh, and went out and bought this thing and then I run to one of my best friends and I'm like, yeah, look at this, I just got this and I saved up so long and it's just so awesome and I'm, I'm so excited about it. And if your friend is like, eh, I have three of those, I don't like it, then it's sort of like, oh, okay, right. And, and that's, that's kind of a very simplistic, a very simplistic example of what, of what actually Satan wants to do with that amazing work of God in your life. So God has done all of these things. He bought you. He, he, he purchased you on Calvary. And he wants you to understand this, this deep love that he has for you. And so he, he's sort of like running and he's saying like, okay, like come experience that I have for you. And, and if you don't really understand what's happening, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool, God. You love me. Okay. Um, and, and, and that's something that we're, we're, we're going to pray for you. Uh, we'll pray for all of us a little bit later. But, um, but this, is, this is actually one thing that we really have to get over, that we, that we have to understand how much God values us. And if we understand how much God values us, we can actually say, okay, you know, I, I actually like myself, and I love my neighbor, and I don't just hate myself and hate my neighbor, but I love the Lord, and because the Lord loves me so much, I can love my neighbor. So, so that's one way that looking like a new creation can be. Another way is that you, you start to mirror Jesus. You start to mirror agape. You start to mirror what God was. Remember? God is, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. And, and, and that's what God wants to make us to be, to be a, a people who are known for being kind, people who are known for being patient, who aren't boastful, who aren't proud, who don't envy. And that's, that's the work of the, this new creature, this new creation that God has, has put in us. I have an embarrassing embarrassing uh, story from this week and and it's funny because I, I find whenever I, I prepare something God uh, God always gives me an example that's that's um, that's really real but uh, yes I, I was at a coffee shop I parked my motorbike in the parking spot that I was allowed to park in um, it was maybe a little bit in front of somebody else's house, but it was still in the parking spot. And I came out and somebody had spray painted on my motorbike. Like, if you park here, you aren't going to find your motorbike here anymore. And yeah? And I was like, oh, I, I was like, I was like, okay, like somebody just spray painted my motorbike. And, uh, and so I, I, I wasn't very happy. And uh, to tell you the truth, you know, there's, there's, Parts of parts of this uh, this First Corinthians thing that you know love does not rejoice in wrongdoings, uh, love is not resentful, love is not irritable. I can tell you when that happened, I was very irritable. Actually, at first I was like, okay, it must be one of the like wipe off like water soluble paints. But then once I found out it wasn't water soluble, I became very irritable, and I was like, oh my, like. Say if somebody spray paints that house, I, I wouldn't actually, that would be what they deserve. I'd, I'd be kind of happy. And then, and then I'm preparing this message and I'm reading this, you know, love does not keep records of wrongs. And I was like, ugh, love does not rejoice in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And I'm like, dear God, please forgive me. I am, it was a little bit of paint and already, it's just this really small thing and already I'm like, oh, I, I hope that person over there gets what they deserve. And, and this was a, a real good wake up call for me that uh, this is really easy to understand, really hard to do in our lives, to be this new creation because of the agape love that God shows for us. Okay, I'll leave you with one more thing. So God makes all things new. He makes us new. He makes us a new creation, and I'm just going to remind you of our heavenly home, what God is preparing us for. And, and we often forget this, but this is just so beautiful. So I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout. 
uh, a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, um, uh, and God himself uh, will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning, or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne says, Behold, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen? So, so again, there's a beautiful example of, of the type of love um, that God has for us as church. Uh, that, that image of the bride being beautifully dressed, that's our new creation. God gives us this... Uh, these garments, and these garments are the acts of the church, are your and my acts. So we are to, to understand that we are a new creation, but we have to work it out in our, in our own lives. We have to reflect this agape love. So in terms of application, it's not that difficult to understand agape. It's really hard to walk in that. And, um, and yeah, if, if you are having problems of you don't really, let's say, you know, you hate yourself, you hate your neighbor. If you don't really understand the deep meaning that uh, God has, has placed on your life, we'd like to pray for you too.